I'm going to share now. So, um, just for the people that are watching the recording right now, we're going to, we're looking at some chapter four type problems that are on old exams. This is from 2016. Um, were you looking at just like that, the first problem right there, or was it the next one? It was a question number seven. Number seven. Okay. Let me, let me go all the way to that one then. Oh, that's not it. There we go. This one? Yeah. Right here? Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is, looks like a binomial probability one. And this would be similar. This is like what we did in section five, two. Um, and this one's a little trickier than I'd say most. The test can, it has 10 multiple choice questions with four options. To pass the test, the student must get at least seven questions right. Um, and we're saying if they just guess. So they would pass the test if they get seven or eight or nine or 10 questions correct. So really, if we can find the probability of those four things and add them up, that's the probability of them just passing this test by just guessing. So uh, again, getting it right or wrong is like a 50-50 and there's different ways to get seven out of 10 right. Like you could get the first seven all right and then you miss the last three. Or you get the first six right and then miss one and then get the next one right and the next two, does that make sense? There's like, so this 10 C7 accounts for all the different ways you could get seven correct. Let me get my little pointer. You could get seven correct and three wrong. So the probability of success is only 25% because it's one out of four. The probability of getting it wrong is 75%. So you want exactly seven right and exactly three wrong. That's the probability of that happening. And then this 10 C7 counts how many different ways that could happen. So if you do that in your binomial calculator, you get a 0 0.003. So the probability of getting exactly seven out of 10 right by guessing is only three tenths of 1%. Not very good. Um, and then you do the same thing for eight, exactly eight, it's even less probable. Exactly nine, even less probable. Exactly getting all 10 just by guessing is probably not gonna happen. <laughs> it's 0 0.000, 000 0, six zeros and then a nine, that's minuscule. But if you add all those up, you don't get a whole bunch. You get about four tenths of 1%. So um, if somebody didn't know anything, like, you know, they just, they, like, they just put B down on every one, let's say, or whatever, they, or they just randomly picked one, the probability that they'd get seven or more out of 10 right is about four tenths of 1%. So this is a binomial. And since this is this or this or this or this, when we hear the word or, we add these down that's how we get it. So this one's, there's not any this complex on the 2021 exam, uh, but this is a good example of binomial and um, essentially a compound events um, with, uh, with addition, so. Yeah, I, I understood that. I just, the mistake I made was I only did um, the first one. I didn't add them all up. I just got, you know, what's the probability that you'll get seven oh so exactly seven yeah so the seven at least seven so that could be seven so here here's another good way here's a good i um there could be a question on your test like this um let's say um we'll say they didn't cheat if they got like uh three or less correct or two let's say two or less two or less correct okay so what's the probability that we could show they didn't cheat and essentially they got zero one or two correct uh just by like they didn't just they just guessed and they got a low score so we're assuming they're guessing but they didn't uh get an exorbitant right the probability of getting these is is not going to happen probably so what you could do is say, what's the probability of zero or one or two and add those all up. The other way would be, you can take the complement, which is one minus the opposite. So you could do three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, add those up and take one minus that. Now that's a lot more work. 
So a complement is just 1 minus the probability of the opposite. So if I was going to look at this, what's the probability they got 6 or less right? Well, that would be 0 0.996. That would be the probability that it got 6 or less right, because it's the complement of this calculation. It's just 1 minus that probability. I'm trying to think if there's one up here that, yeah, right here, number 5. Uh, this is the insurance one. You want to go through this one? This is a good example of, of that. Yeah. Yeah, this is, so insurance is kind of like your expected value. Um, so essentially, you know you're going to spend uh, $220 a year. What's interesting is when you pay your insurance premiums, this insurance premium is for $250,000. If this person dies, they actually don't get a check for $250,000. They get a check for 250000 minus the premium, which is kind of interesting here. So they get a, I mean, it's a very small amount in comparison, but it's, it's always interesting they keep their premium no matter what. Um, so really what you're doing is trying to find out what's the probability that they pass away. So if the, um, the probability they will live is 0 .00, it's 0 0.09995, right? So that means the probability that they would die is 0 0.90005. So the probability of quote unquote success here, that means they would cash in on the life insurance policy. So this is actually a really bad problem because that should have been 0 0.0095. That would have been a little more acceptable. Um, so, which is why I think, yeah, see, it should, it should be right there. See, should have been 0 0.005, not point not right? So there was an error. So what I did was, is I accepted both these answers because there's a typo in this one back in 2016. So this is more accurate what the problem should have been. It should have been a 0.0005% chance uh, that they would cash out in the policy, which is um, then the average cost of that is 100. So that's $125 minus the premium. So, um, Essentially, the life insurance company is making $95 per premium, right? So if they were able to sell this coverage to a million people, let's say, and on average, they were able to make $95 per policy, that would be a $95 million policy, right? Uh, or profit, I'm sorry. But that's kind of how insurance works. They, they figure out the probability that they pay out. So think about car insurance, right? Um, the probability that you would have an accident based on your age and driving habits and all that stuff, they, there's are really complex calculations, but you can boil it down to just like, let's say my, I got a 15 year old on a school permit right now. The probability that he has an accident this year is let's say it's, I don't know, 6%. And the average accident costs like $5,000, right? So you could find what the expected amount would be for him to cost the insurance company and they would make sure they want to charge me more than that because they don't want to lose money. Um, the interesting thing is most young people, teenagers that are insured, the insurance company is going to lose money typically on those policies. There's going to be a high, the probability of an accident is higher and the cost per accident is higher. So they mitigate that loss by making sure they also insure their parents. So you have, this is the idea of insurance. You spread the risk out over a pool. And the more, uh, the more people in that pool, the more risk uh, you can assume, and it evens it out and more normalizes. It's very similar to what we just did in chapter six with that central limit there, right? The more times, the larger the group, the more normal the behavior. And then you can say, okay, I'm pretty confident it's gonna be in this uh, amount or this percentage for this whole group. I can charge a, a premium that's appropriate to that group instead of just to that individual because it's harder for a group to be way off normal than it is uh, for just one person to be way off what's quote unquote normal. So is that helpful at all? I don't, I, that's a long explanation of insurance and what these, but this is, I think this is a good problem to show kind of how this, how they do this a little bit. Um, yeah, that was one of the ones I was confused on the expected value, but after, you know, studying it a little bit more, I got it. Yeah, so just find the percentage of 
it's uh, you know expected value is you take the percentage times the result, right? So what's the percentage? What's the probability that they pass away times what happens? That's the amount of money that would be paid out. You pay out that expected value, and then you take off the premium, or and then that would be the difference. So, so if insurance companies they have actuaries that do this and let's say they run all these numbers, um, they could say, you know what? Uh, we need to charge if we charge one hundred and twenty-five dollars per policy, we're expecting to break even. Now, we're going to be studying confidence intervals coming up. So really, there's probably an interval of risk. There's a low and a high number. They think, you know, on average, it's going to cost between 100 and 150, let's say, dollars per policy. It could be somewhere in there. So the question is, how much risk do we assume? Well, we better charge at least 150 to just cover ourselves because that could happen. Um, and then they want to make profit on top of that. So they, or else that's why they have business. Um, so... I guess insurance, that's exactly what insurance does. It, it spreads the risk out to a whole bunch of people. So for instance, I have insurance on my house because if it burns down, self-insuring myself for the cost of my house would be expensive or my cars. I have liability insurance or collision insurance because that I would need to be able to have, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash on hand to make up for that loss. So an alternative is to charge me a small amount in comparison to a whole bunch of people. And all of us are essentially insuring each other against loss. And there's a company that negotiates this with us and they charge a little markup for that service. So I don't have to worry about if my house burns down, how am I gonna pay for it? Because it's insured. Same thing if my kid gets in an accident and there's liability and they have a million dollars of liability uh, because somebody dies or something, I have insurance that covers that. Or even what they do with insurance is cover people who are not covered. So when, a lot of times in your car insurance, they say, okay, here's your premium, but we're going to add more because we're assuming that there's a certain percentage of the population that don't have insurance at all. So if they cause harm to you, we're also going to have to cover that. Um, which is kind of the way all insurance works. So you're actually, for everybody who has insurance, you're actually paying for insurance for all the people who don't um, because they could also cause loss and harm. And, and that's a risk you have to assume now and you have to pay to uh, take on that risk. That's, is that maybe too complex, but is that helpful? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, I know insurance, I hate, you know, giving money to insurance companies, but they allow me to use my money in other ways besides sitting in a vault, a bank vault waiting to be used. <laughs> because, you know, I, I uh, have obligations to my family in the future that I need to insure against, right? Um, and health insurance is the same way. So I get health insurance and I pay premium or I get it from my employer, but there's people who don't. So hospitals essentially work with insurance companies so that's how a lot of uninsured or people who are not insured with health insurance or they they assume then the government will pick up has programs to pick up the people that don't so that's how, how the system works i think i heard, I, uh, I heard maybe about 15 percent of premiums go towards other people similar like car insurance as a percentage of that that goes to other people who are uninsured uh, to cover costs and uh, this is why costs differ a lot too, based on insured and uninsured, because there's some really weird old laws and formulas that come down to this, and it's super complex. Um, it's hard to get your head around. Uh, but the, the the larger the pool, and honestly, the better the demographic of the pool, the lower the cost. Right? So this is why a young person doesn't need to pay as much for life insurance as an older person, um, and things like that. And why teenagers typically have to pay more than people over the age of 25 for their car insurance because there's their different risk pools. So, all right, well, that's enough about insurance. <laughs> I just know I have to write a big check every year. <laughs> all right, is there other ones on this one you want to look at in 2016? Oh, uh, yeah, actually, I think I was having. I was a little bit confused by cutoff values. Question number 10. Okay. Or I got the I got the second part right, but I didn't really 
Okay. Yep. This is. I don't, this I don't is know a if I got the first one. part right. All right. Do you have your um, normal calculator going? Yeah. So, like a number ten here. This is a really good example one you might see in your test. All right, scores in English tests are normally distributed with a mean of 31.1 and a standard deviation of 6.2. Find the cutoff for the bottom 25%. So essentially, you're, you're asking yourself, where is the bottom 25%? Well, this is where we know we can use that standard normal distribution. So if you put in 0.25 uh, for your after the equal sign and shade left, it should give you a z-score. And I think it's negative 0.67. Can you verify that? I'm assuming uh, about two thirds of one standard deviation below the norm is about the 25th percentile. Are you able to get that on your normal calculator? Uh, I don't think I can get the Z score, but I got the, um, it was in the 16th percentile. Okay, so on your, on your normal calculator, it has the mean of zero, right? Uh, standard deviation of one, that's our standard normal. And then we don't know what X is, that's the cutoff score, right? But we do know the percentage is 0.25. So put 0.25 for the percentage, which is after the equal sign, and then make sure you're shaded left and hit compute and it should give you. Okay. 0.67. Cool. Negative 0.67, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So that's I how you can not know use you that. Could put the Sorry. Yeah, so that calculator will go both ways. You can put the z-score in, it gives you the percentage, or you can put the percentage in and it'll give you the z-score. Yeah, I didn't know that. I think I just did a, I got the z-score manually, like I did some algebra with it. But I didn't know oh, I could okay. do it with a normal calculator. Yeah, you either have to use the normal calculator or a z-table is another way, but it's not as accurate. Um, because this is not a uniform distribution, right? The percentage or the area under this curve is, is changing not uniformly as you go left to right, is it? I mean, it's like there's a whole bunch of area here and there's just a little area here. So um, to actually find that area, you need a lot of calculus, which we don't do in this class. But, but for instance, like this one right here, if you just put negative 0.82 and shade to the right, it'll give you the percentage. Boom, you can just do that in your normal calculator. Um, so that's a nice little tool. Uh, so we know the z-score has to be negative 0.67. So we got that. We just use our z-score formula. So it says Z equals X minus mu over sigma. So we don't know what X is. We don't know what that cutoff score is, but we do know the mean is 31.1 and we do know the standard deviation is 6.2 and then solve for X. So this is like the only algebra problem in this class is this type. So we multiply both sides times 6.2 and do that on both sides. So you get negative 4.2 or 4.2 equals X minus 31.1. Add that over and there we go. So the cutoff score for the bottom 25% is 26.9. So anybody that's 26.9 or below on that test score, on that test is in the bottom 25th percentile if it's normally distributed. And this next one's a trick question that a lot of people miss. What's the cutoff score for the 50th percentile? Since say, what's right in the middle? That is the mean. <laughs> so that's, yeah, but a lot of, I think I stop asking questions like this because when I get wrong answers, it makes me sad. So I just stop asking the question and then I'm not as sad anymore. Right. I think I figured that out too. It's like, well, 50% is right in the middle, so it has to be the mean. Yes, exactly. Good. Yep. But um, unfortunately, that question gets missed more than it should. Uh, the other question, I, like on the last exam, that always, and I, I think I'm moving, I should. There's always a few questions I ask that I kind of cycle through and then I start asking them again and then I realize, oh, I should stop asking those types of questions. The one in the last exam that was like that was, um, remember, I think it was the very first question. Uh, should, we, um, should we use an observational study or an experiment to test toxic subject substances on, on people? You remember that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Unfortunately, there's people that are like, yeah, we should definitely do experiments on people with these toxic substances because then oh, we'll know for sure if it's actually, yeah, <laughs> it's like, whoa, 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 don't, no, 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 we're not Nazis here. We don't, we don't do this. 
um, we don't we don't want to test toxic substances on humans. That, right. You know, really bad. So, but some people do answer that because they're just thinking statistically. Oh yeah, that'd be the best mm -hmm. way to know is we do that. It's like, well, I have no problem counting those wrong. But again, a question: if I just didn't ask it, then I wouldn't have that awful feeling in my gut, right? Um, but it's a good it's a good learning tool. But so for a good example of that is: do we test humans on smoking, let's say. Um, well, we're going to get a bunch of, okay, we're going to randomly select people. Let's get a bunch of two-year-olds. Let's randomly select a bunch of two-year-olds and say, all right, all of you in this group don't smoke. All of you in this group do smoke. Go, let's see what happens in 40 years. <laughs> we don't, that would be awful, wouldn't it? Um, yes. But that's, <laughs> but that's what, that's what an experiment on smoking on humans would look like so we don't need to experiment on everything to find out stuff we can kind of just observe hey we notice that smokers have a higher occurrence of all these things hmm i wonder if there's some other variables at play and then we have to learn how to control for other variables which is what experimentation does but obviously we need to care for human subjects so we have to do it in ethical ways so yeah anyway which is one reason I'm glad in education because usually, you know, for experimenting on humans in education, what's, you know, nobody dies. Uh, like they just didn't learn as much. That's like the worst thing that happens typically. So, um, but this is, uh, this is the, the plight of statistical inference and of research is um, we have to be ethical and we have to do the best we can to figure out what's really going on. And this is not an exact science and there are definite limitations because most of the time we're stuck with observing patterns and constantly having to be vigilant for what we call lurking variables that might be causing the difference we're observing. So, um, or there's variables that are sometimes out of our control that are more dominant than the variables we'd like to manipulate. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's variables that, yeah. So for instance, here's a good one. I've noticed really, really, really intelligent people just always get A's in my class. It has nothing to do with me. <laughs> it's like, I just, they go through, they do their work, they get 100% in their exams and I'm like, okay, that's awesome. They learned, it's good. We measured their learning, that's great. So typically, my focus on design or support or whatever for teaching my classes probably shouldn't be primarily focused on those folks that really it doesn't matter. What matters is the people where it does make a difference. So which variables can I manipulate to help learning? That would be time on task, design, what, at, what things are offered to help, availability, you know, uh, the tools we use with Ask My Instructor, online author, all these things, right? So these things can help move the needle as they say those are things we can control and they can help people that actually need it which is almost everybody so there there's the statistical that's statistical thinking on a statistics class yeah <laughs> that's seems redundant yeah but it, yeah that's the way it is so that's the way we should be thinking um, yeah, I was nervous you using this call, realizing it was a what asynchronous. Yes. Because I didn't. Yep. I thought that meant well, I'm just not going to have any help. I'm just going to have to read the textbook by myself. But you know, it's <laughs> not like that, obviously. So grateful. It, it for doesn't that. have to be. Oh no, this is I. I'm. I. Uh, I really enjoy these office hours, as as you can tell. I. Sorry if I'm boring you, but. Um, trying to teach a little too. So hopefully if somebody's watching this video, they'll learn something about statistics or statistical thinking and all the, it is a very complex thing. So for an introductory course, I think this, this course does a nice job of helping everybody move more in that direction of being able to, to think statistically about stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, did you wanna go over some other ones on this test or did you wanna pick another exam or where you at? Um, I'm trying to remember if I was stumped on anything else in that one. Okay. If I was, I think it was just 
little mistakes I made. Okay. Well, it's good that you've yeah. gone through all those old exams and yeah. You should see no surprises when you take the test then. There should be no surprises. Okay, that's, you should be that's like, oh, good. I've seen problems like this. Yeah, you'll have no, no surprises. And, you know, like I just had somebody call me because they were actually they had an issue their like internet was super slow or something and they couldn't upload stuff very fast on their cam scanner. But they got it done in 45 minutes. So they had like an hour and 15 to get it uploaded. But they're like, well, I'm, I'm assuming it'll work eventually, but I just want to call you just in case and like, you know, I can make the time stamp. And like, yeah. So I'd say uh, when you've taken practice, practice exams, how long has it taken you? about oh gosh it takes me like maybe 30 to 40 minutes I'm I have a bad habit of going through them really fast mm -hmm. which is well, okay if it's just like a multiple choice kind of exam but it's obviously <laughs> well, not you the should case here so. well two hours should give you plenty of time to go over it multiple times yeah. if you need to and yeah you'll be fine cool a did, lot of the did you want Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say a lot of the time is um, it takes me like 40 minutes to actually do it, and then another 15 to 20 to get all the cam scanner stuff working. Yeah, yeah. So I, I try to check. That's why I give plenty of time, hopefully. And um, some people are really efficient. At, like when I I'm very efficient at it now because I've used it a lot. So that's why we hopefully by this exam you've had to do it a few times, right? So. It's, it's uh, hopefully not an issue anymore. Nope. All right. What well, did you want to look at an, another exam or do you feel ready to go? I think I'm ready to go. I don't have any more questions. I think I'm going to show questions. one more thing just to make sure. Uh, and this might be helpful to you, hopefully to somebody's watching this. So I think typically everybody does pretty good with these Z-score ones, right? They're just finding Z-scores. Mm -hmm. But remember the very last section of chapter six, instead of just looking at one piece of data, like this was, it takes a mechanic 9.6 hours with an average of 11.4. To find the probability that takes them uh, 9.6 or more hours, this is very typical. We even did kind of, you know, Z-score stuff. But this is like, what's the probability that the average for a group of nine mechanics would take that long? That's a little different question. So you have to divide by the square root of n in the denominator. So this is just one piece of data. This is the mean of a group. The only difference is you divide by the square root of the number of people in that group. Um, Cause that takes into account the, the group will have, be, will tend to be more towards the middle for the average of a group. So this takes into account that size of that group. Um, so is that, is that cool for you or is that, Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So if it just says mean, use the square root of n on the denominator. That's pretty much the only difference. So, all right. Well, I appreciate you um, coming on here. I, I thought there might be more students, but I think I'm up to about, oh, about 40 students have taken the exam. So I'll have a lot taking it today and tomorrow. I'm going to have your midterms reported by Wednesday. So I will have all of these tests graded by Wednesday. Um, but if you're taking it today, it'll be graded today. So you'll know. Awesome. Cool? Cool. All right. Well, I'm excited. Thank you so much for being diligent with your work and taking the time. A lot of people don't take the time you've taken to review. Um, I, I'm anticipating you're going to do very well. Well, thank you. I have the luxury of time. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's not everybody does, and you're using it wisely, so that's even better. It's all right. Well, thank you so much for going over some things with me. I feel a lot more confident than I did this time last week, so I think I'm ready to all right. go take it. Awesome. That's that's so good to hear. Well, and enjoy your spring break. Um, our next week, you get two weeks to do the next stuff. Um, it is the beginning of what I'd call the most part the most difficult part of the class is, is this coming up next three four weeks um so at least you've got a you've got a big window but maybe you could get your test done today and even start working on that stuff the rest of this week 
and knock almost all that out so you can just go enjoy spring break kind of thing. So Yeah, I was planning on it. If it's gonna cool. be a little more difficult, I wanted to take more time on it. Yeah, and I'll be blasting an announcement out tomorrow, kind of reiterating, hey, make sure you finish your exams, but um, don't delay on working on if you if you wait till after spring break to start working on chapter on the inference stuff, that would be a very bad mistake. Can't, don't take the rest of the week off. <laughs> that would be, I uh, yeah, there be it's it's it need, but I'm it's good that you have time, to but you got to be managing of that. So some students are better at that than others. Like yourself seems to be very good at managing it. So all right, all Megan, right. it's great to, great to meet with you. Um, I will post this recording uh, for everybody, and I appreciate uh, the help you're giving everyone uh, as well. All right. Thank you. All right, have an awesome day. You too, see you later. All right, bye.